Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this uh, Medi Classes Pediatric Endocrine Lecture Series, which we have started over the last. Uh, this is the third session which is going on. This is a program which is basically targeted towards postgraduate and practicing trainees, and we want to cover the entirety of pediatric endocrinology over the time, covering different aspects ranging from uh, right from basics as well as advanced parts as well. So we have already discussed, this is the growth module which is working. We already discussed about short stature, the approach, the basic tools in the form of growth chart as well as bone age assessment. And today, we're going to focus on a very important topic of growth hormone therapy, which is relevant. And what we're going to discuss today is when to use it, how to use it, when should we not use it, and uh, <coughs> as well. We are really honored to have Dr. Mahesh, uh, Professor Mahesh Maheshwari, who is a uh, Professor in Department of Pediatrics at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Bhopal. And he has been colleague uh, with me for a long time. And uh, welcome, Dr. Mahesh. And he'll be providing his inputs on that. So before we start, uh, we'd like to have a few words from you, Dr. Mahesh. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you, Dr. Anrak, uh, for taking this big initiative of uh, taking the pediatric endocrinology forward. Uh, I think most of the time the PG classes has remained only three or four classes in the last, in three years duration. So uh, there are, this is a wonderful opportunity for the postgraduates to uh, learn all the uh, nuisance, all the things related with pediatric endocrinology. So that is a great initiative. Uh, a bit about what really growth hormone IGF-1 is. Then I'll talk a bit about role of the classic indications, the growth hormone deficiency turners in SGA. And Dr. Prateek will then go forward in terms of newer indications about chronic kidney disease, idiopathic short stature, Pradavili, and some of those experimental indications. And then towards the end, uh, over the last half an hour or so, we'll discuss about uh, how do we uh, address the questions on a practical perspective, from a pediatrician's perspective, and how we can answer them on an examination perspective. So this is part of the Medi Classes initiative towards increasing awareness about pediatric endocrinology among pediatricians and postgraduates. It's in fact an honor to introduce Professor Mahesh Maheshwari, the uh, professor in pediatrics at uh, All India Institute of Medical Science in Bhopal. And uh, he was a colleague of me at Ames around 20 years ago. And he has done a lot of work in terms of pediatric endocrinology and is part of both uh, Madhya Pradesh Indian Academy of Pediatrics as well as the central IAP in that uh, perspective. Now, all of you can go and have a look at our website, learning.growsociety.in, which has got a lot of information with regards to different aspects of pediatric endocrinology, including uh, e-learning resources, which are available on our YouTube channel. And we will be posting all these videos already. A huge content is there. And all these videos will also be available recorded on YouTube. So those who miss that can actually go through our on a playlist on postgraduate lecture series. There are the, the uh, Medi Classes learning platform, which has got validated tools regarding pediatric endocrinology and various courses available for fellowship programs, pediatric endocrinology for postgraduates, which you can explore, along with uh, the various uh, free rounds that we do. So we every uh, month we do three programs. One is our overall grand round for advanced topics. The second is more for pediatric postgraduates. And then this is the postgraduate lecture series that we talk about in that regards. You can explore our books at the website and our mobile applications. Patients might not really have a deficiency in growth hormone, but growth hormone has seen to improve the conditions and improve not just the height, as well as general metabolic conditions of these individuals or children who are suffering from these conditions. And starting from the first is the chronic kidney disease. Now, what really happens here in chronic kidney disease, we don't have just the kidney disease. We have the various complications of the kidney disease which happen. That is the acidosis, the underlying acidosis, anemia, and metabolic bone disease due to secondary hyperparathyroidism. And because of this, and of course, the growth hormone axis is affected. And how it is affected, there's a form of growth hormone insensitivity where there is increased growth hormone levels and decreased IGF-1 levels present. So as a result, we have compromised growth, a resistance in growth hormone therapy. And the one good news about this is this is definitely growth hormone responsive. So clinically, how do we assess? Basically, initially, we look at the growth velocity. The growth velocity is an extremely important aspect to consider when considering children on, with CKD for growth hormone therapy. Growth hormone velocity charts are available and any growth hormone velocity less than 25 percentile on the charts is definitely should be taken into account. Of course, rickets should be taken into account, which uh, might hamper the treatment. 
look when the transplant is planned the growth hormone is helpful for pre as well as post transplant but at the time of transplant we cannot give growth hormone therapy so whether there is plan for transplant or not that should be taken into account nutrition of course now nutrition why it is important because it can falsely show low igf one levels and of course if the nutrition is not good no growth hormone nothing will work so hence nutrition assessment and advice should be properly given now at the baseline before starting any growth hormone therapy we need to assess whether there is secondary hyperparathyroidism or not correct it we look at the blood gas and look at various other aspects and especially there is increased incidence of uh, papilledema in these patients and so we should look at fundus for uh, papilledema in these patients we there is no need for doing any growth hormone stimulation testing in a child with ckd who fulfills the oxological criteria so unnecessary testing is not required so initially before starting any therapy you first correct the reversible factors that is anemia correct anemia correct acidosis correct the uh, hyperparathyroidism egfr criteria should be less than 75 ml per minute per 1.73 m square and uh, sorry yeah so growth velocity as i mentioned it should be less and it and it also depends on the age of the child now if the age of the child is very young if the child is like an infant then at that time you can even see 3 months of growth velocity however if the child is slightly older you can look at 6 months of growth velocity look whether the child is planned for transplant or not and of course the height here mentioned to be less is less than minus 1.88 sds and rather than minus 2 what given but basic guidelines what they say for ckd at least low height is mentioned as minus 1.88 sds now dose over here we are not treating growth hormone deficiency we are treating an insensitivity hence the dosage is not physiological it is a pharmacological dose of 45 to 50 microgram per kg per day post renal transplant yes growth hormone is indicated but we start with the lower dose and of course monitoring can be done by igf1 but most importantly it is the growth monitoring see how the growth is falling look at the growth velocity while on growth hormone look at the fundus because there is added uh, because of the underlying disease as well as the growth hormone there could be papilledema look at the renal functions also however what all the guidelines and what everyone mentions there is minimal activity of growth hormone on the renal function but it should be monitored nonetheless now what is expected growth in these children an increase by one high sds after 5 years but if we put it is slightly simpler more than 6 cm per year or more than 2 cm more than the baseline that is before the growth hormone was started addition to that 2 cm per year increase in height velocity should be there that is taken as well, or more than 6 cm per year any slowing of growth look at complications such as adherence such as other conditions any underlying anemia etc that should be taken into account complications not the complications of growth hormone therapy are same anyway it is just that some complication might be in some conditions and some con some complication might occur lesser renal dysfunction is extremely unusual it is a safe drug to be used in ckd raised icp as we saw in the previous slides it was much lesser frequently but here it can occur in 1 1 10 uh, slip capital uh, capital femoral epiphysis can occur and glucose intolerance also very rare it should be monitored and overt diabetes absolutely absolutely rare so any child with a abnormal gait or any renal dysfunction of course not monitoring but any abnormal gait should be looked for at every visit now when do we see the growth hormone is not working any growth velocity less than 2 cm cm per year gain or it has again gone back to the pre growth hormone growth velocity clinically look at adherence and dose and of course rule out the reversible factors this is one place where we if there is not if we are not achieving an ideal growth velocity we can exactly double the dose and look for the ideal response now coming to catabolic syndrome of course here again it's not exactly a growth hormone deficient condition but we can definitely use it here what happens here is a hypothalamic defect which leads to a growth hormone deficient like state but before ruling out growth hormone or giving growth hormone we must rule out hypothyroidism in these patients first before starting any treatment so according to the consensus guidelines the first and foremost is the diagnosis the diagnosis needs to be confirmed 
following which the growth hormone testing is absolutely not required. Same as CKD, growth hormone testing not required here. Now, again, one difference over here, what we see is that the dosage is in milligram per meter square. Now, if we go by kg, the, way, the dose will become extremely huge. So in extremely obese patients, we're not just Pradavili, and we have extremely obese patients, it is prudent to give dosage in milligram per meter square rather than giving mg per kg. In Pradavili, it is not just the improvement of uh, uh, height. In fact, various metabolic improvements are also seen. Hence, growth hormone is a definitely improving drug. The dosage can be increased to 1 mg per meter square per day. Now, contraindications are severe obesity, that is BMI more than 40 kg per meter square, overt diabetes, which is uncontrolled, and of course, sleep apnea, as this can be worsened while giving uh, growth hormone, hence to be clinical and documented. Any presence of psychosis or any active malignancy or respiratory infections are also contraindications to therapy. So, in Pradivali, and why are we focusing especially on OSC? Because it's extremely common and the worsening of OSC has been seen when given growth hormone. So before considering growth hormone in Pradavili, look for features of, of obstructive sleep apnea, do a pulse oximetry. If it's normal, start growth hormone, but do not just let go of that. Follow it up with the sleep study and ask again and again, ask for symptoms. It can be comments, just snoring, nighttime awakening. These symptoms should be asked for. If it is abnormal at the onset, do the intervention and then repeat sleep study. And then you can go ahead with growth hormone. Coming to idiopathic short stature, now, idiopathic short stature, we know, is basically where we do not know the diagnosis. Everything else has been worked out, but we still don't know diagnosis. Even in these patients, it has been seen that growth hormone can be helpful. The indication in these patients is basically when the height is less than minus 2.25 SDS, but only after five years. And of course, thorough evaluation of all the disorders, which we already know, all the uh, which can be treated, all those disorders should be ruled out, and only then we can term it as ISS. Dose, again, over here, we do not know whether, so it's, we don't know whether it is growth hormone deficiency or not. This is, dose is a pharmacological dose rather than a physiological, hence will require much higher and can go up to 70 milligram per kg per day. There is an increase, 50% increase in the growth velocity, but again, then again, at what cost? We need to explain to the parents the per centimeter growth. Of course, this is per US, guide, US data and of course dollars, but even by Indian standards, when we tell them per centimeter, it can be a huge amount. So cost to benefit ratio should be explained to them. There is a benefit, but then at what cost that should be explained to them. A total height gain of three to five centimeters can be considered good. Now coming to the experimental indications of growth hormone uh, treatment, we have, we get a lot of these patients of skeletal dysplasias. And uh, many of them, in fact, most of them, most common of them is of course an achondroplasia which come. Sometimes we can get hypochondroplasia. So they have very, and in fact, uh, well-recognized concern whether growth hormone will work up there or not. So growth hormone has been tried in these patients, but it has highly variable effects and ultimately it is not recommended. There are just orthopedic measures that can change the, uh, uh, the, the dysplasias, the deformities. CNP analog therapy, vosorotide, is definitely a ray of hope in the treatment of achondroplasia. But for now, growth hormone per se cannot be used in achondroplasia. Russell Silver, as Sir mentioned, has very good response to growth hormone therapy uh, in the 11P15 hypomethylation. But with methylation, it has a poor response. And finally, hypophosphatemic rickets. Now, hypophosphatemic rickets, why growth hormone? Growth hormone has seen to have phosphate retaining ability. So since we know in hypophosphatemic rickets, there's extreme loss of phosphorus, there's severe growth failure. So growth hormone has been tried in these patients as the dose of 40 microgram per kg per day. There is only mild improvement seen and there is increased phosphorus levels, but still it is not a designated treatment for hypophosphatic. Maybe try it still experiment. And finally, glucocorticoid, of course, pediatric, pediatric patients, nephr nephrotic syndrome, uh, rheumatological disorders, prolonged glucocorticoid therapy have come with short stature, there basically what happens when glucocorticoid therapy, there's a growth hormone resistance and it basically just pulls down the entire axis of growth hormone, starting from central all the way to the growth plate. Growth hormone dose was tried at 40 microgram per kg per day, but it showed mild improvement and it is not routinely indicated. We can go and have a look at our website regarding various courses which are available, the application and the books. Which